right. Hi, everyone. Oh, there are still a few people joining, so I'm going to wait a second. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Uh, you might know me from my Nintendo talk one and a half year ago. And uh, last edition, I also gave a workshop up about voltage glitching. And this talk is mostly a follow-up about the talk I gave one and a half year ago about the ARM7 boot ROM of the Nintendo DSi. So, first of all, what's a boot ROM? It's the very first code that runs when you turn on a CPU. And it's, most of the time, hard-coded in that CPU th by the way the uh, how the transistors are wired. So it cannot ever be changed. And because, because of, you know, the economic things of why these chips are made. Uh, these boot ROMs are often used to secure uh, the rest of the code so that you are not allowed to modify it, which is often important for game systems because the companies want profit and not piracy. So that means they also contain cryptographic routines and keys, which is an interesting target as always. And what they often do is the ROM itself won't immediately, wait, I should probably use my laser pointer for this the ROM itself won't immediately launch the game because that's like too close for like have to have progress separation of uh, things. So it's first going to uh, read a second stage bootloader from the EMMC, which is capable of actually parsing file systems and stuff because there's not much space left to you know, put, in, put the code of the ROM in. And then you have the system menu, which is you know, the first thing you actually see on screen when you turn on the console. This is actually able to launch uh, games from either the cartridge or also the uh, FAT file system. It, the console itself also has the sconfig, which is a configuration register to turn on or off certain hardware features, and it stays like that until you reset the CPU, and then it starts at the ROM again. And that's how it does uh, privilege separation. Instead, it does not have an operating system. So. Oh yeah, final interesting thing is the ROM is divided in two halves. The first half is always needed because it, for example, has a CPU exception vectors. But there's also the second half which implements the actual boot code and those are completely hidden and locked away uh, whenever it starts in the second boot stage. So some RAM, the SRAM, is not cleared after uh, a reset, which means you know, all the contents are still there. So if you inject a, a fault in a CPU, some of the exception vectors actually point, well, some of them point to DRAM, which will do nothing because DRAM needs to be initialized after a reset. But the SRAM still lives, so if you inject a certain fault that causes a certain exception to occur in the ARM7, it will actually jump to SRAM and then it will just run your code. And that's how I done the ARM7 boot from like two years ago. Now, the problem is no exception vectors point to SRAM for the ARM9, so you cannot use that attack. And you know, that's what happened two years ago. Not much happened since then at first, because you know, I was just a random person. I didn't have any priority to use the fancy setup in the lab for that, but eventually I got to do this stuff for my master's thesis, which means I was suddenly had a, a much higher priority for this. So how do you do the ARM9 boot ROM then? Well, this is a slightly messy diagram of what the boot ROMs more or less do, at least when you know what this half does. So the first uh, fault that was injected, explained here, this will let you take over the ARM9 whenever, basically, so you can do it as early as you want. So then the idea is to actually mimic the ARM9 seven, uh, the ARM7 uh, boot ROM execution as if nothing has happened but then you, quote unquote, forgot to lock out the boot ROMs. The ARM9 will actually wait for this lockout to happen. So if you just do this thing and make it act like this, the console will just get stuck in an infinite loop and that's not good. But if you then inject a second fault here, it will actually continue. And then, you know, that's what, you know, this is the previous slide and then it will continue. And then whenever you run a game or, whatever you have, you can just say, oh wait, ROM is still enabled, and then you can just write it to the SD card or something. That's in theory. In practice, you need you know, a fancy lab setup with an uh, EM fold injector here with a, on a stepper table with a stepper table controller, and then 
a lot of ugly wiring and it also needs to be shielded because I actually got, got, got some interference between the two, which was very fun to debug. Again, not pictured is an oscilloscope that's sitting here and a computer that's sitting there to control the entire thing. Just a generator? Yeah, that's a function generator, but it's not used. Oh, okay. Because I'm using a Raspberry Pico here, which talks to the console over I squared C, and then it can just immediately send a pulse to the EM pulse generator whenever it needs to do that. Because like initially the function generator was also in blue, but that's slightly too complicated. So, well, how do you inject an YAM fault? You first have to know, know where exactly on top of the IC, like this is a photo of the main uh, chip of the, like the main SOC. Then you see like here at this one spot, you actually obtain the highest chance of getting a successful uh, fault injected. And the same thing here, but for the other core, which might mean that these cores are physically under that one spot on the chip. I mean, also maybe not, maybe it's just like hitting a wire that connects the chip to the outside world, I'm not sure. And then you also need to you know, have a correct voltage you put over the EM fold injection coil and you have to do it at a certain correct time. Like you can be slightly late, but it will decrease your chances. And like, there's lots of tuning to involved with this. So yeah, it takes a while. So eventually I got a success. This was in mid-November. I started with this in September, so you know, it took a bit. But yeah, at the end it works. Like here you can see the first boot arm running and then it gets stuck and then you know, it injects the second fold and suddenly it becomes alive again and then it sends out all the data about the ARM9 boot arm. And that's the SHA-512 hash of the boot arm. So you can check if you also have such a setup to, to know that it matches. So now we have the boot arm. What do you do with that? Well, first of all, we can actually properly describe the boot procedure now for the first time. So you have the ARM9, which has a bunch of memory. It actually also has access permissions on this memory because it has a memory protection unit. The ARM7 doesn't, so you can just access memory whenever you feel like it. There's also a spy flash on the console, also the EMMC memory. And the first thing it does is the ARM7 will read you know, at, at the start of spy flash and then also send it to the ARM9. This contains a few configuration bytes which will tell the console to uh, boot from EMMC or to boot from spy flash, but normally it's configured to boot from EMMC. So it's going to read a boot header from the EMMC and also to the ARM7 and then also send it over to the ARM9. This boot header you know, contains the information of where it should put the stage two payload in memory and from where in the MMC to read it and so on. It also has some configuration info of how the SRAM should be mapped because Nintendo made SRAM co uh, confusing because I don't know why, but I did it. It also has an RSA signature. Now, it, this RSA signature does not have the regular ASN1 uh, PKCS or OASP thing uh, format. No, it should be PS instead of, anyway. It actually contains many hashes. Now it has the hashes of the actual code blobs of the next boot stage, which it should verify as usual. It also has the header of this one so that all these values are correctly checked. It also has the stage two AES key. And it also has this hash, which is a hash of all the other things. So that really ensures that this signature you know, you cannot just pull one out of thin air, which just has a random SHA-1 hash, and then you try to collide the, uh, the SHA-1 hash. That, that's just not going to work. Now, interestingly, this means that, you know, because the public key is in ROM, you only can get the AES key that's used by actually dumping the ROM. Otherwise, you just cannot get to it. And also, this is an EMMC, so whenever a system up firmware update would happen, Nintendo can always, at least in theory, change the AES key whenever it would leak, which is you know, an interesting design. So then it will just use DMA to you know, send the actual boot code to the AES engine and then to put it, you know, either send it to SRAM and then map it to the other uh, core or use the FICO and then same thing for the code for the other core. So 
I you know, looked a bit further into the details of the implementation. I could not find any software vulnerabilities and a few other people also couldn't, so I don't think it's just me. But there are some interesting things, like the addresses where it will load these things to, it will not check that there's actually memory behind them, so you can just, you could just tell the boot ROM to just, yeah, just write it here because it's empty. But of course, because of the RSC signature, that will still make sure that it's supposed to be valid. And there are a few other things, like for example, this is part of the RSA uh, subroutine, which will you know, check the padding and then return true. And if the padding is not correct, it will return false. Then here where this function is actually called, it will not check the return value. But due to the, you know, normally this is a problem in like PKCS style uh, paddings, but because, you know, because of this construction with the hash of all the hashes, it will still be caught. Oh. And then there's also a second thing, which is this function here. The way you know, these registers are initialized, you can inject a fault there to you know, make this length really big, and then you can overflow bo both the heap and the stack because they are close to memory and they're kind of small because the boot ROMs don't have much available memory. And then you can also just take over. But this is only on one core, not both cores. And finally, you know, when checking all these hashes, you know, these hashes here, you know, it's only, if it fails one, it immediately skips checking the other and immediately returns false, which means it's an interesting target also for fault injection because, sorry, that means that if you just inject one fault, you can skip the verification of all these hashes. And that's, useful because if you combine all these things in the correct way and you inject the faults at the right time, you can actually get code execution on both cores with just one glitch. I'm not exactly going to uh, talk how that's done because that's for what's going to be in my master's thesis text. I'm sorry for now. Yeah. Also, you can actually use the uh, the way the 3DS got hacked, where you can use a DS, an old DS, a flashcard, and then flash something special to it, and then automatically get, get the jailbreak. You can do it for boring, non-technical reasons, because Nintendo messed up uh, one time, but it's not due to the bootron code. But I'm also going to stay a bit vague about that. So finally, I've made a setup with you know a tiny thing here. You know, the photo is not very clear, but I also have it with me. This PCB is only half assembled, so I can't demonstrate it because the working one is still in the lab. Sorry. So if you remove the Wi-Fi uh, card, which is in a separate PCB, and then put this here, then also solder two wires, which are the two red ones you can see at the bottom, then it will, uh, then it will perform the necessary full injection to actually obtain a code execution during the boot runs. Now, why is this useful? Because uh, I'm going to put this away. Now, why is this useful? Because DSI jailbreaks already exist, like ULaunch, for example. Well, the thing is that all of those jailbreaks still rely on the NAND integrity because they still rely on the second stage bootloader. So if I go back a lot, like, here, all the existing uh, exploits still need this to be you know, present and valid and have a good signature and all that stuff. So, blah, blah, blah. Whoops, that's too far. So, the problem is that the DSI MMC is not very reliable. It will, you know, people talk about, you know, it just dying after some time. So, with this attack, we can actually resurrect new consoles because by bypassing the boot ROM, we can just put a new EMMC chip in there with you know, new everything, or you can just desolder the EMMC chip and not put another one back. So, and that way you can still have a working console instead of having to throw it into the trash, which is great because these cons consoles are actually starting to age. They were released in 2008 or so. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, 
So conclusion, the DSi is more secure than the 3DS because you know, its boot ROMs have uh, actually fewer security vulnerabilities. Nintendo actually tried to base the security system of the 3DS on the one of the DSi, but they messed up really badly. Also for this attack, I need a second order uh, full injection, which means you do have to inject two glitches that have to ha you know, have the correct results, which you know, academia has the opinion that, yeah, in theory that's possible, but attackers are probably not going to do that in, uh, you know, in practical settings. Well, I did, so, nah. uh, Also, breaking the RM, because these consoles are getting so old, you just have to break it to, you know, have keep, let them keep functioning at this point. So, yeah, there's actually good reasons for wanting to do that. Also, doing this stuff is kind of fun, in my opinion. So, that's all I have for, uh, this presentation. Are there any questions? I guess that's a no. All right. Oh yeah, you can also find the slides here and also some other contact information.